Hey, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, especially if you're buying on time. But, but we are just going to give a couple of minutes here for people to join on the session uh, before we dive right into the content. Uh, as some of you, or most of you, uh, hopefully already know, our speaker today is Silvia Perez, founder of Ad Conversion. Uh, how are you with uh, our, I know you've been traveling, Silvia, so how's your day been so far? It's good. I am four hours off a plane and I just touched base in Lisbon and here we are. So I'm ready to go. I got my coffee and uh, I know you asked me if I was jet lagged, James. I don't yeah. know yet. <laughs> I can't feel it. We'll find out. But no, you <laughs> yeah. sound good. You sound fresh. The coffee, no doubt, will, will help to some extent. So I think we're good. Um, I know, obviously, we're joined by uh, Leo Pizarro, head of demand gen at Lunio. And uh, Leo, you've actually got quite a strong connection with Lisbon yourself. Uh, did you did you live there or just did your parents live there and you visited them frequently? My family is from there. So I'm, I'm originally from Angola, which is a long way out. But Angola used to be a Portuguese colony. Uh, but I'll, I mean, Lisbon is my go-to place for holidays. Like I'll go there at least maybe four times a year. Uh, we live, we live like ten minutes away from the beach near Cacavelo, so it's absolutely beautiful. I gotta ask you for some wrecks after this. Oh yes, I have. I actually have a list, uh, like okay. a drafted list for you after this. Awesome. <laughs> have you been to Europe much before, Sylvia, or is this? Uh, uh... Not much. The only time before this was London last year. So this is very much new, uh, expanding my horizons, which has been awesome. And is that you're there for a conference, right? No, I'm actually here for a yes and no. It's mainly for like work and travel, uh, but very much testing the digital nomad life. I've always liked the way it sounded. And like this is me actually very marketer of me doing a test and seeing what it actually is like. And, and from there, I'll decide if I want to do it full time. Nice. Yeah, we spoke to a few other uh, webinar attendees. Actually, next week, we're speaking with Miles McNair. And I know he's in the middle of his own digital nomad uh, experience right now. Uh, Leo, I think, said he, he's out in the wilderness currently. In the wilderness. Them. Yes. It yeah. is funny. I was like, what, what are you up to? And you just sent me a photo of a lion. And he's like, in the <laughs> wilderness right now. Cannot talk. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, hopefully Miles will have returned from the wilderness in time for, for next week's webinar. Um, but I think we've had a few more people join now. Um, so I'm just kind of going to get into a few bits of housekeeping and stuff be, before we get onto the agenda for today. Uh, so again, welcome everyone. For those that don't know, I'm James. I'm the content manager at Lunio. I'll be hosting the webinar today and we're aiming to uh, cover the main points on the agenda in around 40 minutes. And then we're going to have a 15-minute Q&A session with Silvio at the end. So if you have got a question in mind that you'd like to ask about display or video ads, uh, there will be an opportunity towards the end of the session uh, to ask Silvio. I would just say if you have got a question, uh, the best place to ask that question is in the Q&A tab. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side here in Goalcast, you'll see the chat uh, polls. I'll say a bit more the, about the polls in a second. Uh, we've also got some documents and there's the Q&A tab. Uh, the, the reason it's good to put your question in there is it just won't get buried uh, amongst the other comments and the rest of the chat. And it just makes it easier when we come around to that uh, segment at the end to address as many of those as possible. Um, the title of today's webinar is Mastering Display and Video Ads from Awareness to Action. As I've said, uh, this is the second webinar in a series and our next one will be with Miles next Tuesday at the same time. Uh, Miles is the founder of PPC Mastery and I'm sure some of you have already come across his content on LinkedIn. He's quite prolific on there uh, sharing a lot of tips about Performance Max and also Google Ads more generally. So the topic of next week's webinar will be Performance Max campaigns and what you can do to maximize efficiency when using Performance Max. So please do join us for that as well. And I'll say a small bit more about that at the end of the session. But for today, we're going to be diving deeper into some of the tips and strategies Silvio outlined in his chapter of the Performance Market and Efficiency Playbook, which we published a couple of weeks ago now and which is still available to download free and ungated. You can find that in the Documents tab there on the right-hand side. Uh, if you haven't already got a copy, 
Um, you can download it. And if you find it useful, please do share it with others. Uh, it's 115 pages long, and there's certainly no requirement to read it cover to cover. Uh, you can just pick out the sections and topics that are of most interest to you. And hopefully you'll get some uh, helpful takeaways from that. And we have had a lot of positive feedback on the playbook so far, which is always nice to see. Uh, I actually interviewed Silvio previously and documented his top 10 tips for displaying video ads in the playbook. And I remember coming away from that initial interview with Silvio, uh, being really impressed with his knowledge and insights and also his ability to communicate those very clearly. So really looking forward to today's session. I think there's going to be a ton of value in it. Um, first, a few very minor bits of housekeeping to address. We are recording the session today and it'll be available to watch back on demand. We'll also be creating a webinar write-up and posting it on the Lunio blog tomorrow. Uh, we'll email you with the link to that when it's live. As I said, any questions for Silvio, pop them into the, the Q&A tab there and we'll get round to those once you've addressed the points on the agenda. Those questions that we don't manage to answer during the live session, we will get an answer for you and forward it on to you afterwards, but we'll try and get through as many as we can on the call here today. And as I said, um, we are going to open up a few polls and we've got the first poll here, not necessarily related to display and video ads, but it might be interesting to see what people's responses are here um, in terms of Twitter, the Elon Musk takeover, um, how people feel about that. Uh, Silvio, what's your kind of uh, initial take on this one? I have two takes. I have one as a Twitter user. I think I don't personally like what they're doing with the whole verified situation and everything. It's, it's kind of kind of silly. I think it's lost its, its value and people are taking advantage of that. Um, but on the paid side, it's actually gotten better because a lot of advertisers have pulled spend. So it's created a little bit of a vacuum in terms of CPM prices. Twitter has always been historically cheap compared to other channels, but I have noticed a significant decrease in the last three months on Twitter. Mm, interesting. Um, that point about paid side, potentially better. Leo, is there anything that you've noticed uh, on Twitter? Well, I, I would echo that second bit. Like on the paid side, we've seen um, much lower CPC CPMs overall. Um, so I, I guess for advertisers, it's looking much much better in the sense that, I th and I'm not sure if this is rumors, I'm not fully up to date with this, but I believe you can only advertise on Twitter if you have a blue tick. So Elon Musk is talking about pushing advertisers to actually pay to get verified. And I'm not sure if this is going to be included in the package, but if that helps kind of limit or add some kind of confidence around, okay, advertisers that are verified versus non-verified advertisers, it just segments the market further. Nice. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, I definitely lot. haven't seen that yet on the, on the ads manager side. And we just launched like six campaigns yesterday. <laughs> uh, so nothing there yet. I hopefully, hopefully it doesn't happen because that's going to be another hurdle. One of the things mm -hmm. I will echo is like when there is instability, there is also opportunity and you as an advertiser, if your audience is on that channel, right, that creates an opportunity for you to take advantage of. The same is true for new channels. You know, there is a real sense of truth of concentrating your efforts and making sure you're not spreading yourself out too thin, but definitely making sure that you're, you know, like don't let your predispositions and biases stop you from potentially taking advantage of something that could help you, you know, help more people by spreading your message. Like a lot of folks were jaded. They did not want to touch TikTok at all because they thought it was just kids and like dancing videos. But if you would have went into TikTok ads manager and created an account, you would have realized really quickly you have the ability to target based on age ranges. So you can guarantee your ads are not getting in front of little kids or, you know, teenagers. You can get in front of people 25 plus as an example. Nice. Yeah, it's definitely there's a window of opportunity. It's important not to miss. Um, I think we'll probably explore some of these topics in a bit more detail in the final webinar in this series with Fiona Bradley. And when we look at social media ads, but um, definitely interesting to get people's responses to that initial poll. Uh, the rest of the polls will be more geared towards display and video ads. And you can add your responses there uh, in the polls tab throughout the session when we open those. Um, but for now, uh, that's the kind of housekeeping out of the way. I'm just going to share this agenda slide uh, and just briefly cover 
the five points that we're going to cover today. Um, so firstly, we're going to be comparing and contrasting the Google Display Network to third-party DSPs or demand-side platforms. Uh, next, we'll talk about some of the best practices for display retargeting campaigns. Uh, then we'll cover how B2B brands can use display in their ABM campaigns and what Silvio recommends there. Uh, after that, we'll discuss the halo effect in the context of YouTube advertising before closing with a discussion on how to create high performing video ads on a budget. Uh, so with that preamble out of the way, uh, let's get into the content today. Um, so first of all, Silvio, um, let's explore the reasons why in the playbook you recommended that marketers avoid running their display campaigns through Google's native display network and why you typically recommend people use a third-party DSP instead. So where would you like to start there? So much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I will, let me, let me start off by saying this. If you are a small advertiser, you have less than, I would say bare minimum is thousand bucks a month in media spend for display then you are better off just using Google Display Network as a starting point. And then, but if you really want to scale your display program, and I, and I use display with like air quotes, because really display is one piece of a much bigger ecosystem. Display is kind of like the, the entry point that most people get started with when they enter the programmatic landscape. And in programmatic, you have multiple channels that you can take advantage of. So display is one of them, which, and it's honestly one of the least effective you also have connected TV, you have digital audio, and you have native that you can also tap into, but that's only possible when you have a third-party DSP. So in a nutshell, when it's all said and done, the reason why I recommend folks hop onto a third-party DSP like Stack Adapt or AdLib, I recommend Stack Adapt if you're more advanced, you're investing, I would say, more in the uh, 30000 plus a month uh, range. AdLib if you're lower than that, just because of the, uh, the minimum ad spend requirements. But the reason why is because with a third-party DSP, you have greater flexibility and control over who gets to see your message. And then you have greater flexibility and control over what is the hidden cost associated in your supply chain and all the targeting that you're leveraging. So when you run ads through Google Display Network, you get what you get. So in the sense of you have you know, in-market, you have custom intent, um, you can do contextual topics. All great things, you know, good, good, solid targeting and, and a good starting point. But you're only buying inventory from the Google Ad Exchange, which is Google's owned um, supply side that they aggregated through AdSense with all these different publishers that are monetizing their blogs and publications. When you run ads to a third party DSP, you can still buy ads through Google Ad Exchange. So in, in a sense, you can still buy the same inventory that you're doing natively through Google. But the difference is now you've unlocked more controls in the ability to better target, better control costs, and better layer in different safety protocols for con like brand safety and reducing fraud. Nice. And on the issue of costs, obviously the focus here is efficiency. So are those cost savings that you can make quite significant or is this kind of a marginal gains type uh, win? It depends on how much you're investing. You know, this is probably not a big deal if if you're investing, I would say, less than 10K a month on display, you know. But when you're, you know, all the huge, the biggest brands of the world, right, like the Nikes, the Apples, when you see all their digital advertising online, whether it's, you know, you're hearing an ad on Spotify or you're on some some website like Yahoo Finance and you see their display ads, they're not doing that in Google Display Network. They're doing that through a third party DSP. Because when you start to get to a level of scale like that, these, all these hidden costs really add up in terms of uh, marking up your overall media cost. And then it, it gets even worse too if you have like an agency taking care of this for you because they also usually charge a percentage of ad spend. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned Spotify there a couple of times. Um, I used to work for a podcast production company, so this is uh, somewhat interesting to me. Um, have you experimented with, with buying programmatic audio inventory on Spotify? What's your kind of uh, take on that? Very little in terms of like all the channels is probably my least invested uh, in terms of the, so there's different ways you can buy ads through programmatic. 
uh, through the open auction, which is, you know, kind of what it sounds like in the sense of you're buying what you can get, what, whatever's available. It, with Spotify ads, it's, you can buy through Spotify, but you can also buy through like Pandora, iHeartRadio. There's a lot of other audio providers. Hmm. Um, the biggest thing is you just have to make sure that the contextual placements are relevant. The targeting is usually broader. For most folks that actually want to break into audio, I recommend first not doing it through programmatic. I think first you should do like a host read buy, kind of get proof of concept on your audio ads. And then from there, you can start to scale it up with something like programmatic and buying open auctions. And that's a kind of whole kind of webinar in itself, the whole audio advertising world. Um, so, so we won't dive <laughs> yeah. too deep into that today. Um, but Leo, it'd just be interesting to bring you in on this point. Um, I know at Lunio, uh, historically, we tend to see uh, quite a bit of lower quality traffic through, through Google's display network. Um, and in your experience, you know, why is that the case and, and what can people do about it? Yeah, so I guess that if, if you have to look at every single channel out there that's contributing to ad fraud or invalid traffic, display and video, I think specifically display, has been the main contributor in this sense. Um, put it this way, the other day I was looking at a, a friend's website, which is on WordPress, currently on draft, not published. And I was seeing, I was being retargeted by metadata and gong. On, on, a, on a website that isn't even live. And, and they're probably paying for that because that is the GDN network. Um, so that, that's how broken the display network is. Um, there's, also, there's also a chart um, by, or, or a term coined by uh, Bob Hoffman that really hit home, which is the programmatic poop funnel. Um, and, and, I, and when I first saw it, the programmatic poop funnel, and I kind of started looking into the details. Okay, so the way the programmatic poop funnel is, is you invest a certain amount, and throughout those marginal kind of transitions, you're losing money. So you're losing money to the technology you're using to target. You're losing money due to maybe 30% of your ads not being viewable. Um, maybe from the ads that are viewed, half of those are from fake users. Um, so I think what we're seeing, especially in the display space is there's so much flexibility that anyone can run their own or can host their own kind of display network. And there's very little restriction that advertisers have around excluding um, those display networks or excluding uh, those websites. And I think that the websites that we tend to see a lot of fraudulent traffic, they're not necessarily less popular websites, although those see the, the highest rate. Um, but think of websites like the Daily Mail here in the UK. Um, so how many times have you accessed the Daily Mail and actually paid attention to ads? Because they're just bombarding you from left and mm. right. Um, same with, I guess I'll put it out Forbes. So Forbes is a reputable publisher, but again, you don't really pay attention to those ads. Some of those ads aren't even visible on the page because the ad blocker blocks them, but the advertisers tend to pay for them anyways. Um, so I think that due to the scope altogether, we tend to see invalid traffic tends to thrive in that space because advertisers just take that as hey, you know what? I'm happy to take 40% as the cost of doing business. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, I was yeah. just going to say, it's a horrendous UX experience on Forbes and the Daily Mail. Like it's just, it really puts you off engaging with the content. So and just Leo. adding on to what Leo is talking about, one of the advantages when you run ads through a third-party DSP, going back to the low flexibility and control you have, one of the things you can do is only buy inventory from authorized publishers. So there's this thing called ads.txt, and it's basically this manual code snippet that these publishers will put on their website to manually verify that they are a real publisher. So you have, that's like another example of additional filters that you can have of, at your disposal when you run ads through a third-party DSP. And then one of the other points that you raised in the chapter, Sylvia, was um, pre-bidding solutions in, yep, in relation also, to brand safety. Yeah, so you can also have your pick and choice in terms of the the partners you, you want to align with in terms of uh, preventing fraud. So one of the industry best is Integral Ad Sciences. And basically, you can use IAS to help uh, pre-bid. So basically, what they'll do is they'll vet the placement before issuing the, uh, the bid request and basically compare it against your different protocols. So for example, what's the context of the, co of the website? Is it about like adult hate, crime, et cetera? You can add all this stuff as exclusions. You can also add in exclusions based on like suspicious activity. So if like bot traffic 
is is kind of becoming more known and like there's like weird ip addresses hitting that site things like that they're taking into consideration all these additional layers that you wouldn't have at your disposal if you use just google display and then you also have the ability to to partner with different um, providers as well so i don't have to just rely on ias i can also partner with somebody like grapeshot from oracle and i can use contextual exclusion targeting as well so in addition to the IP based exclusions, I can do contextual. So you just have all these additional like levers at your disposal that you could take advantage of. Mm, yeah, th there's there's so much that we could talk about here. Um, but I think just that we do have a few more points on the agenda to get to. Uh, I'm just going to move on to, to the next question. Um, so oftentimes uh, display is kind of most effective for retargeting campaigns. Uh, there are many brands that kind of exclusively use display for the purpose of retargeting and they don't do much else uh, if they're not investing a huge amount of money. Um, so Silvio, could you talk us through some of the best practices uh, for display retargeting campaigns? Yes. The first thing is you want to make sure you're segmenting your audience based on time frame, especially with display you know, most folks, a good CTR in a display ad is like 0.05%. So being able to further segment your audience based on time is really helpful to help increase the likelihood that they're going to remember you and then thus actually click on your ad. So the way I like to do it, I keep it really simple is if I have enough size in terms of my retargeting audience, I like to do a 14 day retargeting segment of anybody that left my conversion pages. So think of this in the e-commerce example, if somebody leaves your shopping cart and you want to get them back and get them to actually complete the transaction, the same can be true in a lead gen B2B example. So if somebody visits your free trial page and they didn't sign up, somebody visits your demo page and didn't sign up, you know, so on and so forth, you can create these segments uh, of anybody that visited those pages in the last 14 days and then serve them ads trying to get them to complete that action, right? So the creative is very focused on you know, the key benefit that they're going to get by unlocking that free trial, right? Or spending the 20 minutes on the discovery call or whatever the key. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Especially about tailoring the, the creative to, to the action that you ultimately want where we to start take. to. Yeah. So this is where we start to get a little bit lighter in terms of the, the offers that we're providing because the, the level of interest is dying down. Right. So this is where we'll usually like, we'll serve different social proof. So for example, like case studies, testimonials, uh, the testimonials, something that's really cool. You can do a display is like highlighting the testimonial in the display ad itself. So that way they can get the associated value of what that person's saying with your brand, despite clicking on the ad. Cause again, assume most people will never click on your ad when they're, you know, when they see a display ads, just statistically based on the click through rates. So this way you can just kind of stay top of mind and further validate the, you know, the reason why they should consider finishing what they started with you. And then last but not least is after 30 days is this is where we'll go a little bit lighter. So this is where you can start to weave in just like educational content related to your, you know, your core offering. So like ultimate guides, checklists, you know, webinars like this as an example to see if that can get them over the hump. For most folks that are just getting started with display, I always recommend you just do the, the cart bouncer campaign, assuming you have enough audience size. If you don't have enough audience size for 14 days, even 30 days will cut it. And you just start there. So just another touch point to get in front of those key people that already had some level of interest. Nice. And it's a relatively low cost touch point again, which is uh, extremely. In. Mm -hmm. And it's just another way for you to create that omnipresence, especially in a B2B setting, right? It's never going to be one touch point that drives that conversion. So it's the accumulation of all these touch points throughout the journey that will lead the person to taking that action that you want them to do. Hmm. So one point that's interesting um, in relation to this is the fact that cookies are going away. I know Google has delayed the, the deprecation of cookies, I think twice now, um, but they are set to go away in 2024, I believe. Yep. Um, and this will have a knock on impact on, on retargeting and display and watch your advice uh, as to how people can minimize the impact of that on their campaigns? No one has the perfect answer. This is in terms of, you know, where am I placing my bets? This is how I'm thinking about it. So I'll give you uh, two, two answers to this question. One, what I'm thinking about doing, and then two, what is the industry working on? 
So in terms of what I'm thinking about doing and how I'm thinking about handling it is uh, one, I'm getting my data hygiene in order. So you have to make sure your CRM is set up correctly and that you're able to build lists of key people within your CRM. So like existing customers, right? Close lost opportunities, et cetera. So you can take advantage of that data and then you can feed into the platforms to leverage that as a targeting point, right? Because that's not related to cookies. The other point is you're going to really want to start to focus on contextual targeting. So assuming retargeting is gone, uh, contextual targeting is still irrelevant of cookies. So this is where you can target different publications based on what that publication is about. So what is that article about, et cetera? Um, so having, you know, at the end of the day, like regardless if it's display or audio or CTV, we want relevant ads and relevant placements. So contextual targeting can allow you to do that. And then really the big push for me where I'm truly putting my, my bets is more so on the social side. So in social platforms, you have the ability to push in-feed content, and then you can retarget people based on their interactions within the platform. So if some, somebody watched a certain percentage of your video, if somebody interacted with your ads, if somebody visited your company page, if somebody subscribes to your YouTube channel, all of those are different retargeting touch points that are available to you outside of cookies. So I can almost see a world where it's like, you're just pushing all this content in feed and you're trying to drive the, the greatest amount of engagement for the lowest cost. And you're just building this huge retargeting echo chamber based on these in feed actions. And then you're just staying top of mind with people that way. Mm, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That was a really interesting point. I remember in, in our first discussion uh, and I thought, yeah, I think it makes sense why you would put your money there as a kind of reliable it's or tough too on the, yeah. it's, it's going to get even like did, programmatic was already hit pretty hard with GDPR, you know, and advertising outside the U S uh, for example, you can't use IP targeting outside of the U S which is really tough. And that's how most display vendors do account-based marketing through programmatic. The industry right now, like there's no set solution yet. It's still very much a race to figure it out. But the, one of the biggest contenders is the, the whole concept of using a unified ID. So there's different vendors that are trying to basically create this unified ID that all these different exchanges abide by. So you can have this one ID that everyone can then use to retarget across channels, devices. That's kind of like the dream. As far as will it become reality, how close we are, that is yet to be, yet to be seen. Yeah, no one has a crystal ball. Um, Leo, just to bring you in on that point, is there anything um, you'd like to say about retargeting in, in the context of display? Ooh, um, <clears throat> I think the first thing that comes to mind is whether it's retargeting across display or social. So as Silva mentioned, um, we're seeing much better results retargeting via social than display. And I think that just has to do with the accuracy of targeting within these social platforms because you're dealing with first party data. Um, you're, you basically ensure that you're targeting the right individuals. Whereas even if you're retargeting across the web, um, there's no real guarantee who's seeing it. I mean, even from a reporting perspective, or let's say, especially within the B2B space, we don't really get that visibility in terms of which accounts are engaging, which job titles and so on. Um, I know there are other solutions out there that, that can help with that. Um, I will add that where, where, where we use Lunio and where I think Lunio plays a role is mostly around feeding the algorithms positive data to allow you to then expand those retargeting audiences. So for example, um, let's say your website is being hit by maybe 20% inbound traffic. Um, and you'd think, okay, well, maybe I'll generate this audience and retarget them across the web. Surely Google is going to exclude those inbound users. Um, haha, surely. Think again. <laughs> surely, <laughs> surely. Think Oops. again, think again. Um, we have some very interesting use cases around that. Um, so, so where it gets really interesting is if, if, you don't, if you're not excluding those visits at the start, and you keep feeding the algorithm maybe 20% of, of that invalid traffic, when you then go to expand that audience, so let's say I'll use Meta as an example, so using the 1% lookalike, or even Google's own machine learning algorithm, which is based on lookalike audiences, it is taking into account that 20% of data that has been skewed anyways. So I think what, what's happening in, uh, in the advertising world is it's more important than ever to ensure that that data is accurate, accurate, as accurate as possible. 
because these machine learning algorithms will optimize for more of those individuals. Mm -hmm. Garbage in, garbage out, always. Yeah. Um, just to bring on to the next point, um, Silvio, you mentioned uh, briefly about how the restriction of IP targeting made it made it harder to do ABM through through display. And in your chapter in the performance marketing efficiency playbook, you addressed uh, some of the misconceptions that B2B brands have when they're using display for their ABM campaigns. Um, so could you talk us through what some of those misconceptions typically are yep. and how you can best use display uh, in the context of an ABM campaign? Totally. So the first big mistake I see most B2B companies doing with ABM display is they are spreading their budget out too thin. So the, what they'll tr typically do is they'll load up an audience in whatever tool they're using. And maybe that audience has a thousand accounts, but then they're only spending in total, let's say $5,000 a month. When you do the math and you divide the amount of budget per account, you'll realize very quickly that there's not enough budget to truly saturate any one account. And that's also assuming each account gets equal distribution, which is not true. Some companies are larger. They're going to get more impressions than others. So the biggest trap you want to avoid with display is dwindling your budget across too many accounts. You really want to focus on segmenting your account list is what I always recommend is if you have a thousand accounts, can you segment it, you know, to three different ways, your tier A, tier, a, uh, tier B, tier C, maybe your tier A is like your top 50 dream ideal accounts like if those 50 closed you would be the happiest person in the whole world what are those 50 and then segment them out and then make sure that they get at least minimum 300 dollars a month in budget this is kind of my rule of thumb uh based on just average cpms and whatnot so that you can truly saturate that account most people the the biggest and especially like a lot of these i won't go too into the bashing of the b2b <laughs> display providers but like a lot of them, they're very loose with like how they associate influence opportunities and revenue where like if it's like one impression, they'll associate it with an opportunity being created. It's just not true. So what you really want to make sure you do, and you can just do this in LinkedIn, looking at the demographics report, is you just want to make sure that whatever company you're going after, that they actually saw you enough times. So when it gets really powerful and like actually helpful is when you start to see a correlation where you can have a... Uh, you know, let's say 10,000 impressions by an account, and then you see an influence opportunity being created. I actually have one client right now that uses a very popular uh, vendor, I won't name names. And they, I asked them, you know, like, hey, are, is this working? How's it going? And they're like, you know, I'm not really sure. So what I told them to do, and what I think everybody listening could do as well, if you're in that situation is do a postmortem. So of all the accounts that you are currently trying to break into, create deals with, for your display campaigns, take a look in your CRM and just see how many opportunities were created from those target accounts in the last quarter that you were saturating these accounts and trying to break into them. They're not going to be directly associated, so it's very much going to be like influenced. But just take a look very, you know, let's say you're targeting Microsoft, Coca-Cola and Apple, right? Did any one of those accounts actually become an opportunity in the quarter that you were trying to break into them? That's the, the first point. So we took our baseline. So we took all the spend that we put against that vendor. And then they were also doing stuff outside of that with LinkedIn, where they're doing one-to-one -one campaigns, which is the example you have on the screen. And then we took that baseline of, okay, we spent this much across our, our ABM efforts. This is the amount of opportunities that were actually created from our target account list. Now we have a baseline efficiency number of how this is working. What we realized was our our tier one accounts that were getting these one-to-one -one campaigns, 21% of them, an opportunity was actually created versus our tier two accounts where we had much more. It was like, I think it was like closer to 150 accounts. Only about 7% of opportunities were actually created from that cohort. So from there, that got really exciting for us because we're like, okay, we're still not 100% convinced that it was the display or the one-to-one the -one campaigns that did it. So now what we're doing is we're doing a, a pilot. So we're taking this quarter now, we're taking our 20 top tier one accounts, and we're going to be exposing 10 of them with display and one-to-one -one LinkedIn company ads. And the other 10, we're not going to do any one-to-one -one efforts in terms of uh, display or LinkedIn targeting. And we're going to let it run for the quarter now. And we're going to see after the quarter's up, what happened, right? Did we create more influenced opportunities from the exposed cohort versus the one that wasn't? 
And thinking like this and being strategic and concentrating your efforts is how you can truly make these types of channels actually do something for you. That's a really interesting case study. Um, be great to hear what the results are when they uh, when they finally come in. But it's great, yeah, to approach it in a in a methodical way and not assuming that um, yes, it was it was absolutely the display campaign and making sure that you're confident. Um, for for everyone listening, one thing I want to stress is like the best advertisers they think like investors and they execute like scientists. My client was asking me when I just got on the call with them, I, you know, this is a new client, I'm getting up to speed. They're like, what do you recommend we do with display? How do we, how do we optimize this? And I'm like, well, wait a second. How, do we, how are we doing in the first place? <laughs> What's our baseline? Where are we working from? So for those of you, like ambiguity is not your friend when it comes to paid media. Just because it's not easily measurable doesn't mean you can't set up a system to allow you to have an understanding of what's going on here. First, you want to figure out correlation and then prove causation. For sure. And I think that kind of feeds into one of the next points that we'll touch on in terms of the halo effect in YouTube. We're not going to get onto that just yet. But um, in terms of creative, uh, specifically primarily for one-to-one -one campaigns, um, is there any top-level advice? I know, Leo, you kind of pay very close attention to the creative that are used in these kinds of campaigns. So... Leo or Silvio, uh, if you want to talk a bit more about the, the ads and, and the kind of creative that works best in these campaigns. For, yeah, I'll just give a quick two cents. For these campaigns, specifically for ABM, the, the true gold is making sure that it's 100% personalized to the company. So one of the cool things you can do with programmatic is uh, that you can't do in Google Display Network is dynamic creative optimization, where your creative can dynamically change based on the company that it's associated with. So you can do personalization at scale, which is really cool. This is gonna be affected with cookies though. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But the, the long story short is, you're already at a deficit when it comes to display, right? Just given the numbers, 0.05% is a good click-through rate, right? So already by assumption, you need to already believe that your ad will never get clicked. So at the very minimum, how can you create an experience for that end user that is so visceral that it, it, it gets them to actually notice something that is truly unnoticeable because we've just been trained uh, to, to tune out these uh, display ads. So the way that I've found to be best and just for my clients and also what I've just seen from other folks is when you call somebody out directly. So like the most powerful word in advertising outside of free <laughs> is somebody's name, right? Like I always think of the example, like if I was in a subway station and I just go, James, all the James will turn around, right? And look back. Mm. That's what you want to do with your display ads. And it, you have all the cards stacked against you. So truly, I don't think it's worth doing display unless you're going to be hyper relevant. Because the other challenge with display as well is going back to, you know, the whole methodology of think like an investor, execute like a scientist. You want to control the variables. The reason why display million placements you're eligible to show on right when you run ads on facebook there's no more than 10 placements max that you're eligible to show on so you already have a greater advantage in terms of figuring out right and reducing the potential error versus when you're on display and you're doing prospecting you have to rule out all these millions of placements you know what i mean like that's tough so what you want to do is you want to take advantage of display or programmatic or wherever you're buying your media from and you want to hyper target as much as you can. So you can go back to the fundamentals, right? Relevant ad, relevant message for the right person so that, you know, you stack the deck in your favor. Hmm. Nice. Leo, anything to, to touch on quickly there? Uh, yeah, I'll very briefly add to that. I think, uh, yeah, really great analogy with the investor, investor sci scientist full. Um, I'll, I'll be brief and I'll, I'll mention that. Okay. So advertising at, I, I'd even go deeper than at an account level. So if, if you're looking at advertising at scale and you're looking at, let's say, ensuring that you are capturing individuals' attentions, the reason why we've added Loom's ad onto the screen as an example is they're calling out specific accounts. And it's that familiarity, that familiar image of, I work for Salesforce, I'm scrolling through, I see a Salesforce logo. Is this the post internally? 
Um, on top of that, there's a person that's looking at me on the screen. There's actually so much on this display ad that kind of ticks those boxes around ensuring that it, it at least stops the scroll. Um, but I'll, I'll add to that in the sense that think beyond the display down to the advertising message. What kind of message are you trying to communicate across? And if you have a refined target persona, speak to the worker or down to the individual. So for instance, um, a great platform that does this really well is ClickUp. Um, or actually, I'll use Trey.io because they, they've been using this message for a while, which is um, eliminate the work that's tedious so you can focus on what you love. And that is, foc that is tapping into that individual want. So even at a professional level, I still want to do that. But at, at an individual want, I want to be doing more of what I love. So being able to pull that through down to an individual level rather than just be stuck, stuck it at, at an account level. Because sometimes you might be targeting the right persona, but it turns out that while they're on LinkedIn, they, you know, they're not really focused around how they can make their, the company that they work for progress. They're more focused on themselves. So how do you then present that content based on the platform that they're on? Yeah, and a really powerful use case of using display or, or you know, targeted one-to-one -one LinkedIn ads is for deal acceleration. So because you're dealing with smaller audience sizes, you have less open opportunities. This is where display and like LinkedIn one-to-one -one can be really powerful because the required audience size for display is much lower. So what you can do is you can actually do multi-threading. I actually was uh, interviewing a company called User Gems and they're like masters at this. And basically what they do is they'll not only try to target an account, but they'll segment that account depending on the size based on the different groups within the committee. And then they'll show ads to those committees within that target account to drive awareness. And it's all personalized to the committee. So like they'll have a, an angle around finance for the CFO if they're trying to get in front of that, that buyer persona, uh, one for marketing and so on and so forth. And a lot of times what you'll see too with these LinkedIn one-to-one -one plays and these personalized ads is people will share it internally. Or like what I've seen in the past with my one-to-one -one campaigns is folks from the company will comment on it saying like, hey, everyone else at this company. So like they'll kind of like engage with it in a funny way. Um, but yeah, it definitely breaks patterns. And in terms of click-through rates with the one-to-one -one campaigns on LinkedIn, I've seen click-through rates of like eight, seven, six percent, which is pretty crazy mm -hmm. given the average. Yeah, focusing on, on shareability. I think same goes with organic social which is you might not see that engagement straight away, but people are definitely talking, talking behind your back. Hmm. Yeah, Sylvia, when you mentioned about just the using people's names as, as one of the most powerful words or in advertising, just immediately that scene in Minority Reports, I don't know if you remember where Tom Cruise is like walking through the, the subway and it's this futuristic dystopian where all the ads are targeted to each person and the ad is using the name of each person. That is it. Uh, I mean, you know, like... Obviously, everything in everything in moderation. Anything too extreme is probably bad. We don't want to get to that point, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean that is the most effective, right? If if it's super targeted to the person. At the end of the day, like nobody likes ads, and the reason why they don't like ads is because a lot of times it's people pushing things on them that are not relevant or helpful. Hmm. So if you actually have a product or service that can benefit your you know your end consumer. And you can get it in front of them in a way that's you know enjoyable and different. That is going to resonate. A hundred percent. So we, we're slightly running over for time. So we're going to leave the discussion for display there. And the next two topics that we're going to touch on are related to YouTube and, and video ads. And then we can still get around to the Q and A section at the end. Um, but um, in terms of YouTube advertising. Uh, as you mentioned, in terms of measurability, uh, there are some things which are very easy to measure with YouTube uh, in terms of click-through rates and um, those direct, directly attributable conversions. Um, but in your chapter, Sylvia, you talked about this wider halo effect, which is a bit more difficult to measure, but it is possible to do. And there are definitely things that you should set up uh, and pay attention to prior to running your YouTube campaign and after running your YouTube campaign. So you, could you talk about the halo effect and what people should know about that? Yep. So essentially what the halo effect is, it's the spillover of people who start looking you up directly or they find you organically through the search engines and they don't necessarily click on your ad directly. So it's like this halo effect. It's like the rising tide raises all, all ships, that old saying. 
uh, it's very true for YouTube. So what you'll find often is, you know, just using the numbers that I've seen, like a good click through rate on a YouTube ad that I always try to strive for is 2%. That's always like my, my benchmark. And that means 98% of the people are not clicking your ad, you know, and what we often see is we'll take a baseline of our traffic of direct and uh, organic search before running our YouTube ad campaigns. And then we'll also measure it after the fact. So you, what we'll start to notice is the spillover of uh, traffic. And then also too, if you're using Google Analytics, you can look at the multi-channel funnel report and you can see the different conversion paths and you'll start to notice like YouTube as one of the first or mid journey touch points. So essentially you'll get this increase of traffic of people reaching out to you because they saw your ads on YouTube, even though they didn't directly click on your ad. Where it's hard, of course, is we don't get that last touch direct attribution. So outside of just, you know, using what, what we have listed here, looking at your branded search lift, your direct traffic, looking at your view through conversions to understand are people doing things. Uh, you can also have self-reported attribution. So you can have some sort of field on your form saying, how did you hear about us? That's another great way to see, you know, if YouTube is actually working for you because people will start to list YouTube as a source. Um, and then another thing too, that's really helpful is session recordings. So you can use session recording software to basically analyze how your YouTube traffic is performing on your website. And that's extremely insightful because you can see, are they engaged? What are they doing? You know, like you can actually see their, their user journey in real time. And then if you're in B2B, another really extremely helpful thing is having some sort of tool to be able to resolve company IPs on your website and then be able to segment by source. So you can see what kind of companies are coming to our, our website from our YouTube ad campaigns. So those are all things that you can do to kind of just kind of prove to yourself and get a handle on if this is actually working. But the one thing I want to stress is like, this is why I'm so gung-ho about YouTube over display personally, is with YouTube ads, you're only charged if somebody watches 30 seconds of your video, which is crazy. So you get a ton amount of views and impressions for you know, a fraction of the cost. And the cool thing about YouTube ads as well is if somebody doesn't watch 30 seconds of your video, if they skip right away, you're not paying for it. So a lot of people, when I talk about YouTube ads, are like, oh man, I hate YouTube ads. I always skip them. And I'm like, great. That's the point. They didn't pay for it. You know what I mean? They're getting free impressions. And also too, like, I don't like YouTube ads as well that are irrelevant, that are spamming me, right? I just saw the ad like a video ago and I'm already seeing again, we don't want to do that. We want to set frequency caps and create a good experience, but it is a massive opportunity in terms of building brand awareness, especially if you're operating in a new category. Hmm, for sure. And that, that kind of leads on directly to the next point. Um, so th there's so much that we could talk about here in the interest of time, we're going to have to keep it relatively brief, but I think one of the most interesting points that you raised in, in your chapter, Sylvia was the importance of your video script and why you should, spend a lot of time and energy on getting your script right uh, why outsourcing your script isn't always a good idea and also this concept of the hook and why you should pay particular attention to the opening five seconds of your video essentially yep it goes back to the pricing model for youtube you're charged on a cost per view basis and a view is considered when somebody watches uh, at least for in-stream ads it's when somebody watches at least 30 seconds of your video that's when you're getting charged so we want to make sure that we optimize the hook, which is the first five seconds of our video ad. And ideally what we wanted to do is we wanted to attract the right person, the right viewer, somebody who is qualified, and then dispel and reject everybody else that is not. With YouTube, you typically have broader targeting. They do have some really great options uh, like custom intent and customer lists. But generally speaking with YouTube, you're casting a much wider net versus something like LinkedIn. It's much more hyper segmented. So really your creative itself needs to do a lot of the heavy lifting and a big trap people fall into when they get started with YouTube is they just repurpose a video that they have on Facebook or LinkedIn, but that video is not optimized. The hook is not strong and it's not unique to the YouTube platform. Uh, the other thing too with the hook is you can compartmentalize your video. So when it comes to testing your creative, usually what we'll do is we'll write out a script and we'll write like 10 different variations of the hooks. And then the rest of the video is the same. It's one variation. So then we'll film the whole video, but we'll just film the hook 10 times and we'll keep everything else the same. And then we can compartmentalize the video and then test diff 10 different versions of that video with 10 different hooks. And the reason why you don't want to outsource your script and, you know, obviously like there are no 
absolutes in marketing. If you can find a really good writer, awesome. But for the most part, nobody knows your customer like you do. So you have a lot of rich, nuanced insights that you can bring to life in that script. And that's why it's really tough to outsource it. And it's also really expensive. Mm, and one of the really interesting points that I think you raised in your chapter as well was just when you're trying to draw inspiration for those hooks is looking through your testimonials and looking what people are calling out, what they like about your product, what pain points you're helping them solve, and then using that to feed into those hook variations that you, you discussed. And then through a process of testing, honing in on those hooks that, that perform best and kind of going yep. from there. I, I always, uh, I'm, I'm sure I didn't come up with this. I heard it somewhere, just stuck in my brain. It's like the customer is the marketing genius. You know, they have all the insights, they have the language, they have the, the pain points, the know-how, the, the more you can tap into them, the better off you will be. So one really tactical thing I love to do, especially when I'm getting started with new clients, is I'll go to a review listing site. For me, I work in B2B SaaS pretty exclusively, so it'll be like G2, and I'll look up my client's G2 listing, and I'll read through all the reviews, and I'll create a spreadsheet, and I'll start to itemize the different things that I see come up. So like different pain points the customers address that we help solve, um, key language they're using to describe our product, like key takeaways and benefits. I'll start to categorize all that in a spreadsheet. And then I'll start to basically each one that I see gets repeated, I'll add an additional count. And then at the end, I'll sort it based on the one that has the, the largest count. And then that can help me prioritize like different angles to test in my ads. So in this case, it could be YouTube ads, it could be LinkedIn, and you can start to test different messaging based on these different angles that your customers are repeating. And this is also super rich in terms of insights to improve your website messaging. I have this one client where every single review, it was like 87% of them mentioned how much they love their customer support team. But when you go to my client's website, you don't see anything about their customer support team. <laughs> and it's mm. the thing that most people are addressing. So once we realized that, they added it to their homepage and now we're running tests to see what the lift is like. And now we're thinking about how can we start to bring that into our creative as well. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And in terms of bringing it into the creative and just to give people more context on what good looks like, um, we have got some examples of YouTube ads that Silvio, you really like. And if you go to the docs tab on the right hand side and you scroll down, you should see uh, best YouTube ad examples, which will take you to uh, a one sheet, which you can download and you can click through and watch these uh, videos on YouTube. Um, Leo, just to bring you in on this final point, um, are there any examples or brands or things that you've seen on YouTube that really stand out to you in terms of the, the creative itself? Oh, uh, I would say <clears throat> brands, and I'm going to use a very bu bus term here, which is brands that tend to be more disruptive and challenge the status quo. So uh, as Silvio mentioned, it, it doesn't feel like an ad, I think, especially on social. So it might be, let, let's mention, let's use Cognizant as an example. So co Cognizant strategy and, and Gong do something similar. They, the ads that they run are actually webinar snippets trying to educate the consumer on problems that they face every day. Like this is just valuable content that you're pushing out across social that people are going to tag other individuals within an ad. I mean, how many times do you come across an ad on LinkedIn and you see a number of comments, shares, reposts on an actual ad? Not that many. But when you look at brands like Gong, um, I believe Metadata do a little bit of that. Uh, Cognizant, you start seeing that they actually leverage paid um, as if it's their organic channel to push out valuable content to the user. One of the biggest misconceptions with paid social is everyone is so obsessed and I see so many like guides and videos and this is like the title that people lead with. But when it comes to paid social, everyone is obsessed with like, how do I create ads that stand out? But it's actually a little bit counterintuitive because your first goal with paid social isn't to stand out, it's to blend in. You want to create ads that mirror the native best practices, that they look organic to the platform because your goal is somebody sees your ad and only after the fact they realized it was an ad. That's truly what you're after. So like kind of having that, that shift in perspective first is really helpful because it'll like instantly you'll realize you need to understand the platform. You need to spend time on it. What is it like as an end user? And then you need to study the native best practices and you take those same native best practices and you apply it to an ad perspective. And then at this point, it's just optimizing to, you know, create stronger hooks, et cetera, yeah. different visual imagery, but you're still 
it doesn't, it's not like you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, right? Where somebody is on Instagram stories and they see an image ad that is distorted and it doesn't fit the placement and obviously doesn't belong there. Nice. Right. Okay. So we've got five minutes left. Sylvia, do you think we can try and blitz through some of these questions that have come in? I think we have. Let's do it. We should be able to get through them and we'll just start run through. I'm going to share some of them on the screen and we'll just see how many we can get through um, before we finish here. So the first one, um, one sec, I'll just stop sharing the slide. Um, how do you prevent overlap when running multiple ad exchanges on a third party DSP? That's one of the ex that's one of the advantages of using a third party DSP is you have the ability to frequency cap uh, across channels with some of these DSPs, which you wouldn't have otherwise. So take depending on the DSP you're using, just reach out to your support team and ask them, and they can they'll let you know if they have that capability. Nice. Uh, can we see the multi-channel funnels report you mentioned in GA four from first of July as well? Yep, uh, it's it's available. Person? Nice. Um, one sec. So you mentioned connected TV. What would you recommend uh, it for B2B? And what's the minimum monthly quarterly budget you would recommend for connected TV? I wouldn't recommend connected TV for most startups like early stage startups, you know, you pre series B. You're probably much better off focusing on building awareness on LinkedIn, YouTube. Connected TV is much more a broader net. Uh, but if you do want to get a crack at it, I would say you probably don't want to invest anything less than 10K minimum. Um, and this is where I would really lean into a DSP like StackAdapt because they don't have uh, minimum contract spends. Uh, speaking of StackAdapt, next question. I use StackAdapt via an agency and StackAdapt advertise for agencies. Can I use it as an in-house program? Yeah, reach out to them. They uh I feel like I'm a sponsor for StackAdapt. <laughs> so I'm not affiliated with them at all. But yeah, reach out to them, go on their website and, and see what that looks like. And that's that's also actually a pretty good call out. It's like you're also getting dinged on a percentage of ad spend for management. Uh, and if in the case StackAdapt doesn't make sense for you, given your level of activity, then I recommend looking into AdLib because they're a completely self-serve DSP. They kind of give you the best of both worlds in terms of getting more flexibility, but not having to pay an arm and a leg for it. And the minimum budget required for them to get started is 500 bucks a month. And then you can cut out your agency. Sorry, agencies listening to this. But. <laughs> uh, final question. Um, I'm just going to show on the screen here. So we have got a, a short answer, but we've been advised by our media agency that contextual targeting bears a much higher cost than running standard DB360 DB behavioral ads. Is this true generally? And will these costs go down? Generally, yes, just because the the placements are more considered premium based on how you're targeting. I, I hate to say it depends, but generally speaking, yes, contextual is is more expensive than using some sort of like behavioral audience. Those behavioral audiences as well are also really broad and they're leveraging those third party cookies. So uh, their effectiveness is going down. Nice. I appreciate you blitzing through those questions, Silvio. Uh, we got through most of them. If there was maybe one that I missed, um, we will get answers to that after the session. Um, I think I'm just going to very quickly wrap up here. Uh, big thanks to you, Silvio, for all the tips and insights. So much useful takeaways uh, from this. And I'm looking forward to, to putting together the write-up for this for the Lunio blog tomorrow. Um, could you just let people know where to go if they want to connect with you and if there's anything else you'd like to share just before we wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you want to connect with me, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Just search my name, Silvio Perez. I also have a YouTube channel. I've created over 50 plus tutorials on digital advertising, all different types of topics. So if you're looking for guidance on how to get started on like Google ads and different channels, feel free to check me out on YouTube. And then uh, if you want more B2B advertising content specifically, then go ahead and check out adconversion.com and join my newsletter where I send out two to three actual tips on paid ads every week. Nice. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, the next webinar in this series will be at the same time next Tuesday with our guest, Miles McNair, and the focus will be on PMAX. Uh, you can check out Miles's chapter in the Performance Market and Efficiency Playbook if you'd like to get a flavor of what to expect during that session. Um, Leo, could you just quickly talk people through how they can get a 14-day free trial of Lunio uh, if they're interested? Yeah, absolutely. 20 seconds. Um, so you can scan the QR code or just type in uh, the URL on the link. So lp.ludio.ai free trial. And what it is, it's basically an audit of your campaign 
no strings attached, no code needed. Sounds unreal. We need to keep convincing prospects that actually this is legit. <laughs> um, so no strings attached and we'll be able to give you a breakdown of your valid and invalid traffic. Nice. On the button, we'll wrap up there. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, all the best with your display and video campaigns. We'll see you in the next webinar.